very proud and happy to be able to partner with ISPU for this work. Now, a little bit about what we're going to be covering today. We are setting out really today to talk about access to mental health care during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly for Muslim healthcare workers. We also want to explore, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the possible complications of discrimination for the Muslim healthcare workers and to understand what kind of coping mechanisms they used during this process. And some of the uh, findings that we're going to present today have been interesting um, and expected, and some are not so much. So we'll share all of that soon. Also, to let you know that we were able to receive ethics or IRB from Stanford University. And our work is very much a cross-sectional survey that uh, which we went um, to many different platforms to really reach out to the Muslim healthcare workers. And it was held uh, soon after the pandemic started. So really January to May of 2021, if we can take you back to that point in time. In terms of what I'll be presenting to you today is the results of what are 49 items of a survey that looked at demographics, but also psychological distress, discrimination, coping strategies, and what were the sources of that stress? And as Dadia mentioned earlier, our sample size was nearly 700, 692 to be exact. A little bit about why it is we decided to do this work. Um, here's some research, if I can take you back to 2020, right at the start of the pandemic itself. And there was a research coming out that was actually quite concerning and saying that out of all the different groups of people, the, the healthcare workers, and this is broadly, not just Muslims, all healthcare workers and people on the front lines were really the ones experiencing probably some of the most increased distress and anxiety and detrimental well-being because of all the work they were doing, fearing for their own well-being, but at the same time of trying, of course, to care for others. And beyond that, there was a lot of social social isolation due to the pandemic, but also a feeling of disconnection from friends and family and just being on the front lines nonstop that really sig significantly worsened their mental health outcomes. Now, pre-pandemic, we already know that healthcare workers who came from minority backgrounds were less likely to feel supported and have increased stress. So we imagined that during the pandemic, this would be even more complicated and actually compounded, which is what some of the early research was in fact showing. Lastly, that American Muslim healthcare workers were really understudied. We didn't have much data at all to point to. So this is really the impetus of the work here. Now, if we look at American Muslim healthcare workers, here is what we knew kind of going in. Right, We knew that there was social isolation from coworkers post 9-11, these last two decades have been particularly difficult. Islamophobia has definitely been on the rise. There was also additional scrutiny in hiring them as, as clinicians or as healthcare workers, people who, um, whether these are doctors matching for residency or whether they're in any other form of healthcare, also on the patient side, after they're in the field, patients refusing to be cared by Muslim healthcare workers because again, of discrimination or Islamophobia, um, and then high levels of kind of job turnover and a decreased sense of belonging. This is what the literature showed before our study. And so our question really was, how did COVID-19 impact this population? If you add to it the discrimination that they felt at uh, being Muslim on top of everything else that was happening in COVID-19. Here's a little bit about our sample. And here are some of the you know, initial results that I'll share with you. Three quarters of the survey respondents were women, which is really interesting, of course, to, to think about what that means um, in terms of the, this, the healthcare setting and also those who chose to take the study. In terms of ethnicities, we really did our very best, I wanna reassure you, our very best, to try to reach out to um, many different segments of the Muslim community. And in certain populations, we really did try to oversample, uh, particularly our Black and African-American Muslim populations. But there's just very little data altogether um, on, in certain subgroups of the Muslim population. And so you'll notice here that the majority of our population is Asian and Arab, but you'll also find that the category for those who are wondering about other, I'll just say off the bat here, that they are um, populations like Latinx communities, um, Afro-Caribbean and other groups, subgroups who are maybe very slim in terms of their overall numbers that we put together in the other category. So that's a little bit about who was able to take the survey. And then when we look to um, who were the survey respondents in terms of age, we find that the majority, 
if you look at the yellow and the, the orange here, basically, or, you know, and all the other slum, slumber parts of the, the pie there is under the age of 40. There is, of course, a subset that's over the age of 40, but it's important to note that, the, that there is a younger age group altogether uh, in the survey. Half of the survey respondents were physicians because we did try to do very interdisciplinary kind of study here where we looked at all types of healthcare workers. But this is also to point out who exactly was in the study, including um, you know, beyond physicians like nurses and therapists, dentists, anybody who was really on the front line of doing COVID work or exposed to COVID from their patient populations. And one in five of our survey respondents said that they had high contact with COVID-19 patients. And if you look to, um, you know, here where it looks like high risk, which is the orange and then medium risk, there's a pretty significant kind of exposure to COVID from those who took this survey um, versus those who are kind of just virtual, for example. This particular slide is of importance and one I wanna take just an extra moment to really focus on with you because it shows up again later in our findings as a very important point. More than half of the survey participants reported that religion was extremely important to them. And you see that in the orange column. But if you look at the light blue column next to it that says very important, you'll see that if you combine these two together, over 90% of our survey population felt that it, religion was extremely important to them. And I'll say right off the bat here that this was a self-administered question. This was a question that it was a self-report, excuse me, that they were meant to really ask, uh, you know, answer on their own behalf how important they felt religion was. So we're really talking about a sample here that felt that religion was a really important part of their daily life practice. And I'll come to this point again later, but it's really important that when we talk about a faith-based group, that we bring in questions about their faith into the discussion as to see whether it is or not a form of coping they were using. We'll come to this again. Also, according to the poll, the, the ISPU's American Muslim poll in 2020, the numbers are actually very similar. So you'll find that over half of that population, and that was, I should clarify here, the American Muslim poll that ISPU does every year is a cross-sectional poll. It is, um, the sampling from it is not like our sample, which would be called a convenience sample, people who chose to enter into the survey, versus the annual poll is actually something that is more cross-sectional and happens um, and it, it, whoever, who really, whoever picks up the phone, if you will, it's a random sampling is the one who's asked the questions, yet the numbers match very, very closely. And so I just want to point that out that we didn't, even though that was an interesting finding in our survey, it's actually very similar to the American Muslim population in general. Now we come to the impact of COVID, our findings, the impact of COVID on mental health and distress. And here are some of the main findings that we came to. Stress, including psychological distress and anger, which is very interesting here and important to bring up, were all increased as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Four out of five healthcare workers experience increased stress. And while this is something we probably would assume, you know, that would have happened, it's important to kind of see the exact numbers. It's obviously a very high, um, important uh, point to talk about the majority here. If you look to discrimination, you'll find that nearly half of our sample reported at least one form of discrimination. And if you're wondering what different kinds of discrimination we looked at, we looked at religious discrimination, like Islamophobia, for example. We looked at things like uh, gender-based discrimination. We looked at religious-based discrimination. And when there was at least one form of discrimination, it definitely had a higher level of psychological distress, like depression and anxiety, associated with it. And certainly this is true if it was a combination of multiple different forms of distress. And if and it ranged anywhere from if you had one or more form of, this, of the discrimination, from two times to even six times is likely to report serious psychological distress. We also know that Islamophobia in the workplace, um, but we found rather that Islamophobia in the workplace actually was associated with increased healthy 
coping mechanisms. And I know this might come as an interesting point to people, like what, what, is, what does that mean exactly? For us, when we looked at um, healthy different coping mechanisms, we looked at religious-based ones and also ones that we could consider to be neutral. For example, things like calling your friends and family, exercising, taking a walk, right? In addition to the religious forms of coping mechanisms were things like praying, reading Quran, um, uh, doing um, dua, for example, different forms of religious coping. And we found that those were increased when people experienced Islamophobia. We also found when people experienced racial discrimination in the workplace, that those were associated with decreased healthy, healthy coping mechanisms. And we'll talk about all of these in, in the slide coming up just very soon here. Now, nearly one in three Muslim healthcare workers report occasional or regular Islamophobia outside of their workplace. This is very important to understand the implications kind of broadly, that it's not just within the workplace. Muslims are also Muslim outside of their workplace and therefore they're carrying this kind of stress with them and experiences from Islamophobia everywhere they go. And when you think about what that means, and you look at the other forms, not just Islamophobia, but also gender and racial discrimination, it, it's all additive. And I think that's really important to understand in the larger scheme of the study. I promise we talk a little bit about coping strategies. So here they are. When we look at behavioral coping strategies, we were talking about, um, you know, for example, healthy coping strategies. So take a look at, with me at the columns here. You'll see there's items like calling friends and family or making more prayers like dua or things like exercising or reading Quran or extra prayers or journaling. Right. And so you have all different forms of uh, types of coping, both religious and non. And all of them were considered to be used. And certainly the most utilized were calling friends and family and making more dua or supplication. In terms of um, the most commonly used unhealthy coping mechanisms was eating comfort food. And I want to make an important point here that these are not necessarily um, you know, we're not kind of putting a, a judgment call on these things. Rather, what we're saying, they're, they're pretty much neutral in most cases. But when you look at the literature, these behaviors are often linked to avoidance and addictive behaviors, which is why we were making sure that we added them here and looked at them. So eating comfort food is the highest, but you can also see shopping online, sleeping more than usual, to, uh, tobacco products or drug and alcohol. And to see that, you know, kind of the range of what people were doing, especially if it was considered to be unhealthy ways of coping. Also, gratefulness is an important concept that I want to point out here. And you'll see that it's a very high percentage, 93%, say that they try to remember the blessings and thank Allah um, in order to cope through the COVID-19 pandemic and the work they were doing on the front lines. Also looking to for a lesson from a lot in this situation. What does this all mean was something that happened quite often, along with some of the other uh, cognitive based thoughts that you see listed here. Now, cognitive coping, we found that there was a lot of mental health care uh, utilization that was increased by the Muslim healthcare workers in COVID-19. And we were, we were very happy to see this actually, to know that there was an increase from before COVID to after COVID to actually reach out to mental health care professionals. This trend is something that's worth pointing out because it is a, a shifting trend in the general Muslim community. And uh, we're glad to actually see that's happening. Now, the key findings, just to summarize everything that I mentioned here, kind of just bring us back and conclude. We found here are some of the key things. Coping strategies, right? Some of them are linked with increased stress. Also that remembering blessings and thinking God was widely protective and again important to discuss when talking about faith communities and research. Seeing a mental health professional, as we mentioned, was actually not only increased, but also widely protective. So these are really important uh, strategies when thinking about how to move forward in helping our Muslim healthcare workers. Finally, our recommendations really is to make sure that mental health care is accessible and it allows for religious coping mechanisms to, to come into to surface so that therapy can be culturally and religiously congruent for those who are trying to reach out to the mental health care uh, support. 
Also, because of the high levels of Islamophobia, we would very much recommend incorporating Islamophobia awareness and prevention to make sure that this is part of any of the existing DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion type programming in healthcare settings or other educational settings. Furthermore, we also want to say that whatever um, maladaptive coping mechanisms there have been that showed up, we want to make sure we build awareness amongst American health, Muslim healthcare workers, uh, because this is an ongoing pandemic. We're not quite out of it yet. And there's a lot more to, to really help build and educate our community. And to note the point about gratefulness, right? To be grateful or in the Arabic term, shukur, right? Um, the Islamic term. So here to this, that this is part and parcel of the religion of Islam. And for that reason, to make sure it's incorporated in any sort of mental health well-being type programming because of how high level um, it was reported amongst our population here. And then we wanna make sure that we incorporate mental health care into the coping strategies that we propose. So in conclusion, I invite you all to read the entire report. You can find it on ISPU's website and to join their mailing list, it's isp.org backslash signup. Um, and particularly our report, there's the link there and we can put it in the chat if you'd like to access the entire report and read in more detail. And I thank you all very much for this, uh, for tuning in for this part of it. Back to you, Dahlia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rania. Um, and I want to bring on um, our two other panelists now, Dr. Mona Masoud and Marguerite Hill. Assalamu alaikum, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Let me just uh, introduce Dr. Mona and Marguerite. Um, Dr. Mona is an outpatient psychiatrist in the greater Philadelphia area and a board member of a nonprofit community mental health organization called Muslim Wellness Foundation, which many of you, of course, are familiar with. Um, and this organization provides mental health uh, and educational services to the community. Dr. Masoud is also the founder and chief, or and chief organizer of the Physician Support Line. And I'd also like to introduce um, Marguerite as well. Is Marguerite on? I'm just having trouble. There you are. Yeah. Okay. My, my Zoom is the problem. Marguerite is the executive director of Muslim ARC and is an adjunct professor, blogger, editor, and freelance writer with articles published in How We Fight White Supremacy, Time, Huffington Post, Al Jazeera English, Islamic Monthly, and Muslim Matters. She has five years of full-time experience working in community organ organizations and five years of experience in administration and technical writing in Silicon Valley, small businesses and startups. And there's much more to say, but I will, I will stop there um, just to give our panelists time to express their, their thoughts about this report. And I'll start with Dr. Mona. You, you started a very interesting uh, and important project, um, the Physician Support Line, that was providing mental health support to physicians during the pandemic. And it's been operating for more than a year now. Can you tell us some of the lessons that you learned and some of the key observations that you, that you noticed since you launched this project? Um. Yes, um, Jazakallah Khair again for having me and um, just a little bit of introduction about the physician support line itself. Um, Alhamdulillah, it's, um, I was just looking at the timeline and it's it's like so many things with COVID. It's been over two years now <laughs> since mm -hmm. the launch um, and, it's, and it's been quite telling the lessons we have learned from our colleagues and um, mentors and peers um, speaking on the support line. So the physician support line is um, was is a grassroots um, effort run by over 800 volunteer psychiatrists nationwide to um, unapologetically support um, medical students and physicians, um, which started off as navigating um, the pandemic, but then started including many intersections of our um, personal and professional lives over the course of these past two years. And the goal, inshallah, is for it to be sustainable um, ongoing. And um, a few lessons that really stick out to me and I think are relevant um, for, for um, physicians 
right now is the intersection of of so many different identities that we have. In one hand, we were, you know, called into action for being the front line of this pandemic due to our training and our knowledge and and being um, being put in that position. And so that was the expectation, this um, this expectation of heroism, which was not something that, you know, as, as flattering as it may have been, um, you know, that that people had said that to us. For us, it was it was quite a bit of pressure um, because we were all going into this pandemic um, very much as lost as many of the people we were taking care of. And um, we didn't have all the answers. We this was the novel coronavirus for us too, and um, but we also felt this intrinsic pressure of people are counting on us. We have to somehow create hope. We have to be able to not only um, you know save lives of our patients, but um, it really felt that the stakes were so high if we were not able to deliver on this promise or this expectation of heroism. And it was a, something that it was not an easy thing to share with others, This our own anxieties, our own fears, that we were not going to be able to do this, um, that this task was too impossible for us to be, um, um, you know, to be able to do. And, and, the, and there was so much fear that went into it, fear of contracting the illness ourselves, um, fear of giving it to our own families, um, fears of not being able to save our own patients, and um, and honestly, the, the fear that we were not cut out to do this, that we are not actually what people think we are, the fear of failure, the fear of being an imposter, really. And then you add on, which is, uh, you know, the, the study, which was what really interested me in, in wanting to take part in this. Then you add on who we are as human beings and how we, the different identities that we hold, whether they're gender identity as, you know, uh, what does it mean to be a female physician or a male physician? What does it mean to be um, our racial identities in terms of what does it mean to be, um, you know, a black physician versus an Asian physician versus an Arab physician versus an immigrant physician or an American one? Um, there was so many different intersections and then we had political intersections and we had um, where we are in our own lives, such as our ages that we were able to go over here. And all of these different things was instead of, you know, allowing us to understand ourselves better, it, it really made um, the American physician experience more complicated because we had to learn how to navigate all of these different nuances of what made us us um, simultaneously. We had to um, we had to not only be physicians, but we and and be the front line of this pandemic. But we had to continue being mothers. We had to continue being um, you know um, involved uh, wives or or you know or husbands. We had a lot of these kind of um, issues going on. And so what this this did was it, it, um, it brought a reckoning for American physicians where we had to decide now um, that, you know, who did we want to be? What did we find to be most important to us? And we had to, um, you know, uh, we had to really own that. And um, and now I hope that from from all this experience of, of learning what we are, we're going to be more unapologetic and in, 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 in self-advocating in what we want. That includes in the system that we work in, um, that includes um, how we identify um, as not just being a cog in the healthcare system in America, but being an active member of it, of making decisions um, that affect um, patient outcomes, but also our own self um, care and our own mental health, such as work hours, such as hazard pay, such as all of these different um, um, you know, points that we really had to own and self-advocate for. So it, this is the beginning of a big conversation um, on what you know, um, physician or healthcare worker mental health is going to look like. But I'm thankful for the opportunity to kind of get our, you know, our, the discussion going and people talking about it more. So Jazakallah mm-hmm. Khair for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Mona. Um, incredibly unique and, and critical point of view that most of us didn't have to, to be able to, 
to listen in and hear and understand what people are going through. And, and you're right. I think so many of us look to physicians as being these, um, you know, indestructible humans that uh, we can always look to to give us the answer. And, and yet they're just as afraid as we are in many cases. Uh, you mentioned um, in your remarks about, you know, coming, showing up as not only a physician, but you're a woman, you're a person of color. And I want to then turn to Marguerite to kind of help us understand the impact of all of these different identities as people are walking into the hospital trying to save lives. Between 19 and 25% of respondents said they experienced Islamophobia, racial, or gender discrimination. Can you help us uh, understand a little bit more about systemic discrimination? And what do you recommend uh, to address these, especially in the healthcare system? Thank you. Yes, it's um, listening to the report and, and thinking about the the discrimination that was reported um, in the study, where um, which aligns with um, other studies like um, there's Serafina et al. who talks about the discrimination that physicians of color experience, where and that's like kind of a qualitative data where the majority of the participants said that they experienced significant racism from parents, patients, colleagues, and institutions, right? So, and, and that added stress, you know, so we could see the unhealthy um, responses, you know, because this is compounded, right? Um, and, you know, the stress of the pandemic and exper experiencing discrimination. And with nurses, there's another study um, in Becker that says around 63% um, of survey respondents said that they had personally experienced an act of racism um, from a peer, a patient, a manager, or supervisor. So, so this is really significant as we think about um, healthcare, which already produces inequitable outcomes. And it's important for us as we think about like what is systemic racism? Um, how do we need to understand it? Um, systemic racism is synonymous with structural racism, but when we talk about structural, we're talking about more of the historical factors, like kind of like the long durée, like history, the historical forces. Systemic can show up in different institutions, right? So as we think about structural racism, we're talking about the bias among institutions and across society. So it's very broad and it can be cumulative and compounding effects. So those daily microaggressions could actually lead to inequitable outcomes. So it could lead to aversions. It could lead to say, for instance, like lower pay for people of color in, in a field or less opportunities, less prestigious positions that they may get from network bias. And typically when we teach um, anti-racism, we talk about the four eyes of racism, of ideological, which are like the kind of common tropes and the stereotypes. Um, there's the internalized, which can also be that how individuals internalize racism themselves, but also the internal dimensions of those who've adopted racist norms. So those are the private beliefs. Um, there's the interpersonal racism that we see. So those, that's where we kind of focus a lot on the microaggressions. There's a lot of focus on this interpersonal dimension. And institutional racism are the unfair policies, discriminatory practices, and unequal outcomes. And, and with that, you don't, you can still have racism existing in institutions without bad people, you know, like where people aren't claiming to be racist or you can't identify a racist per se, but those outcomes, right, that can lead to extra pressures of those who are from targeted identities. Um, discrimination happens on a systemic level of targeting like gender-based discrimination, gender-based oppression, as we would say, um, Islamophobia is systemic, it is structural. And so you could see that across different fields of the, you know, from access to healthcare, and this can even include Muslim healthcare workers or Muslim um, healthcare workers who may now feel, you know, that they're over trying to overcome so many obstacles that they may not want to address certain things that are leading to these inequitable outcomes. Um, some of the approaches, what I found was the study was very helpful in, in giving people coping strategies, especially when they're able to identify 
things now that we understand what microaggressions are um, from a on a broader level. And what we can do is start to think about um, creating um, anti-racism competencies within our institutions, which would create opportunities to address how Islamophobia shows up, how gender-based discrimination shows up, and how does that actually erode um, the working conditions for healthcare workers. My, my approach is multi-pronged in doing anti-racism. And I think it's definitely, it's really, it's not fair for Muslim healthcare workers and people of color to have the onus on them to be full advocates. It's important to have this, um, that the institutions take accountability and recognize that this is happening, right? And so even for those coping strategies that the healthcare workers peers should know that Muslim physicians, Muslim nurses are experiencing discrimination. So they should have outlets within their job place too, and not just kind of having to go upon like their own internal resources, but places where they can debrief and heal and that we can encourage our, our healthcare institutions to promote um, healthier environments and to counter discrimination. Obviously we, can, we give, you know, healthcare workers provide care regardless of whether a patient is racist or an Islamophobe or not, but it, it does provide, it does cause a lot of stress on those who are trying to provide that care. And it's important for our workplaces to, to address that. So this study is so important that we can actually begin to advocate um, that our healthcare institutions include Islamophobia um, in their work on racial equity, because often that is left out. Absolutely, thank you so much. Dr. Rania, back to you just to kind of sum up, as the primary investigator on this project, what would you like us to walk away with? So much of what both Dr. Um, Mona and uh, Margaret said, both, both. I mean, honestly, this concept of uh, this very last point that you made is so powerful, which is now we can finally point to something and say, and and, and hopefully there's, and, and there's more beyond our work here, but this is one really important piece of the puzzle to say, look, Islamophobia really needs to be part of, um, you know, our, I would say all institutions, <laughs> right, to kind of hold them accountable, but certainly our medical institutions, absolutely. And I'm being part of one and part and parcel and, and actually very involved in our DEI work. It is a pill battle sometimes to say, hey, Islamophobia too, you know, um, but now you can actually point to something very concretely and say, this is why. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and we're going to now turn to questions from the audience. So please uh, continue to submit your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, one question that came up from Dr. Asim Padella, um, he says, do you, all per do you all perform predictive modeling? It seemed you suggest prote protective efforts of certain strategies against ill health outcomes. Did you see that association statistically? Happy to happy to take that question. Um, I would say everything that we um, put forward actually uh, was, in fact, something we did kind of logistical um, uh, uh, regression. Uh, regression. Thank you. I was trying to find the word <laughs> <laughs> to be able to make sure what it is that we included as part of the as part of the study. Um, and yes, we were able to figure out, um, and, and actually I would point uh, to the entire, to the full survey. I, I might say this a few times here, but because some of the questions um, are, are more fully answered in our full study. Yeah, and our report is now live online and, um, and does include the statistical analysis in an, uh, in an addendum at the end in, in the, uh, with the full table and, and the appendix, and, yeah, it's the appendix. Full. We're both fasting brain, I guess, but appendix at the end. Yes. Um, great. Uh, another question uh, that came up is um, from your research. It looked like racial discrimination in the workplace was more likely linked to less healthy coping behavior in Muslim healthcare workers. Um, can you speak to that? Just that, that was a very interesting finding. 
um, and the challenge the Muslim community has in confronting racism within itself. The question is right on. And I would invite actually the other panelists to share with me in, in answering this question, because, you know, we were able to really kind of tease that out and pull it out in the study, but it speaks to something I think we all know um, I, I hope we all understand and know is kind of widely pervasive within our Muslim communities as the questioner is asking. Um, so absolutely. And I, and I wonder if others want to speak to this as well. I think it's very, it seems hard for me to know, like, you know, whether there's like correlation, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, there's a difference between correlation and causality. And so, um, you know, and that we can possibly guess like why um, religious discrimination may actually kind of affirm like a, um, a, a solid, like, um, like a positive self-identity or maybe even like some group boundaries of like asserting one's Muslimness in that space. Um, and then why, like, how would that be a little bit different for racial discrimination? So it's definitely, I think we'd have to do a kind of deeper dive and like kind of explore like what does, um, like Islamophobia does, like how does that help in, in the kind of formation around um, developing the Muslim identity? And then with the racial identity, which is something that one can't change, right? Like, it's like, I can take off my scarf and, but then if somebody says, take off that scarf, I'm like, no way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like for, you know, my skin tone, it's like, this is something I can't change or assert. And so maybe there's like, uh, you know, a different type of approach that, that I would do, or maybe just uh, the forms of discrimination that may occur because of race. So say if someone's pointing out an Arab identity, as opposed to a religious identity, because we can't necessarily just, you know, like even like with, with Asian, South Asians that, you know, they may experience racism in a particular way, which would be disti distinct from Islamophobia. So, I mean, those are all things I'm so interested in exploring and like how does our um like those rup like the disruptions that we may have when we encounter discrimination um have us assert our identity in that space or find ways that we turn to those that um I think it's a, maybe a little bit I don't I mean I I have some theories but I mean I'm definitely interested in kind of exploring exploring that and then possibly that I do think that for those who do have faith, it's always like that is always a great option to find strength um, within one's community. And then also, you know, like faith based practices actually bolster one's identity and, and give some resilience. So, yeah. Lots of questions left after that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I'm, I'm also very interested, like you said, Marguerite, in how people perceive discrimination and its cause when they are both Muslim and Black or both Muslim and Arab or Asian and how they how they interpret it as either racial or religiously based, um, I think is, is a really interesting question to, to delve into more as well. And right. And also, I mean, it's also who we show up for or what which intersection that we show up for in terms of, you know, defending or, or being um, present about like, you know, um, are we going to show up if there's like, you know, there's Islamophobia versus if there's Islamophobia and then there's also anti-Black racism? And is there, are we going to show up for our own communities and our own cultures more than we would for other cultures and other communities? Because even though we can identify as all being um, Muslim, do we have implicit biases in, within ourselves that will, you know, make us rationalize against who we show up for within our own um, own, own, own relationships? religious groups. And so, yeah, there's, there's so many nuances and the more you look at it, the more complicated the picture gets, but also um, I think more telling the more you look into it. Yeah. And I, uh, I'd encourage everyone on, the, you know, listening to check out our toolkit on getting race, right. On looking at intra-Muslim racism within our community. Um, and I think we can put a, a link here in, in the chat um, so you can, take a look at some of the resources and the research that we have compiled to address this very challenge within our community. Uh, I have a question now from someone who says they live in Sweden and they said, and 
Uh, I live in Sweden and both systemic racism and interpersonal racism exist in our institutions, academia and healthcare. But our institutions somehow deny that there is existing, that, that racism exists in the workplace. So what is your advice on how we can start to raise awareness on both individual and group levels, uh, i.e. healthcare providers? What can we also do on an individual level? So, so the, if you guys don't mind, I, I'd like to take this one on, or at least start the conversation. It, it's been a converse, um, it's been a, a conversation topic amongst um, a lot of our um, physician act, um, activism and and uh, groups, uh, specifically under this kind of broader category of you know um, of you know burnout versus um, you know systemic um, causes of burnout and. Um, and I, one of the uh, dilemmas we've been finding, and I think COVID has unearthed and, and forced healthcare workers to talk about within their healthcare systems, is that you know is is burnout being such a um, common topic or being you know uh, uh, being um, uh, you know set, used almost as a way to kind of blame the people going through it, um, such as you know. Um, if, if you say somebody's burnt out, then it kind of leads to this idea of, oh, well, there must be something wrong with you. Maybe you need to look into that. Maybe you need to be the um, one who um, takes care of that. And, and it kind of diverts the attention from, you know, the fact that um, that there, there's real systemic issues that are causing burnout. And so, you know, when I use the analogy that we don't say um, when a house um, is on fire, we don't say, you know, um, it was burnt out. We say, you know, what burned it down, and and these are and and it's forcing us to kind of you know re rethink this. And I think Muslims and minorities, especially, have a problem within these bigger systems, especially healthcare systems, which are multi million dollar systems, and they're privatized in America. I'm not quite sure about Sweden, which leads to a whole another a problem. Is that you know when the bottom line is being prioritized, then healthcare workers are going to be just cogs in this bigger system. And if we see ourselves as that, or we internalize ourselves as being just cogs rather than being, you know, important members of, of, of healthcare, then we're going to start, um, um, you know, blaming ourselves and and seeing ourselves as being um, voiceless. And so, to answer your question, the first thing that I would suggest is have more of these conversations um, amongst. Peers, and this is what Physician Support Line was really about, is about peers talking to peers, people who've had shared experience of, of, these, um, of these outcomes of what it feels like to be a healthcare worker right now, and, and, and normalize and validate each other's experiences on how they're being treated, how they're being, min um, you know, their um, concerns are being dismissed or minimized. And really, um, you know, there is a power in the voice when it goes from being one story to being a story of many. And then all of a sudden you have a movement. So you go from a narrative to a movement. And so, but it has to start with first giving yourself permission to talk about these things. And we tell ourselves as immigrants, as as um, minorities, that we have to be quiet. We have to be, um, you know, well-behaved. We have to be the model minority. We have to do all of these kind of like expectations and to our own detriment. And so the first step I would encourage is to start the conversation, start it somewhere, see who, what avenues that opens up, what networks people have. And then all of a sudden you have a movement. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to add to that? Just really briefly to say that it's really important to have the data points. And I think we spoke to this a little bit before, but it's really hard into the, the questioner here. And, and though I can't speak directly to Sweden, here we are trying to do this in the American <laughs> Muslim healthcare experience. But um, if something like this, if we could help that person, you know, that researcher kind of help replicate something similar in Sweden and other places to really have the data points to say, here is the evidence that we're finding you know, um, and really start making it a, um, a push. I'm, I'm obviously as, as a researcher, along with a clinician, I'm, I'm re just really strong about collecting that data because sometimes it's really hard to pinpoint. Um, and you just talk from kind of anecdotal experience, like the questioner was saying, and not from hard data. So I hope that helps a little bit too. Music to my ears, collect the data. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Okay, another question um, from Dr. Radha Khan. 
Jazakallah khairan. The study shows a large percentage of treatment seeking slash mental health support among mental uh, Muslim healthcare workers. And it was mentioned that this is a growing trend among the Muslim population in general. Could you elaborate on this? I could start, and I know, um, Adelia, you have some data, too, to, to share as well. That's kind of newer data that's come through. Um, at the at the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, you know, the data we've been collecting over a decade now, it's, it's been really interesting. When I look at one of the very first studies we did, which was MPAM, which turned out to be, a, a you know, a validated psychometric scale looking at attitudes and perceptions to mental health amongst Muslims. And it was so clear that, the, the you know, you go to, and it's almost always friends and family first. And then eventually you get to the imams, the religious leaders, and very far, far, far down the line were the actual mental health care providers, people who were the professionals in the field. Even primary care providers were before are the mental health care providers. That's what data about 10 years ago looked like. And in that, in the course of this decade, we've definitely been putting out that, uh, that those questions um, out in our studies to find, is there a shifting trend? And we're actually finding that there is in fact a shifting trend. Some of our most recent research is on the topic, a difficult topic on the topic of suicide. But we asked that question there too, you know, who are people reaching out to? Um, and we're definitely finding that there must be a generational difference, but also kind of an overall, even just across the entire nation, uh, a, a more awareness and willingness to talk about mental health. And so that awareness is also kind of finding its kind of trickle down effect, finding itself into its way into our Muslim communities as well. Um, and then ISP has collected some recent data. I don't know if Delia want to yeah. talk about that. Yeah. And actually, I'm so I'm so glad you asked about it. We we will be releasing it literally in the next few days. But um, I just finished kind of uh, analyzing this data, which I'll I'll go ahead and, and divulge here. Um since you're all, you know, this is just a group of special friends, but don't tell anyone we're, we're about to release it in a few days. But what we found is basically exactly what Dr. Rani just said, that to our surprise, Muslims were actually as likely as a general public to report seeking out mental uh, health care support if they were in distress. So um, those who experienced distress during COVID, whether they were Muslim or of any other background, were equally likely to have sought out a mental health provider, a mental health care provider. Unfortunately, those in distress, and this was a great deal of distress that they said that it you know, impacted their everyday life, only a third sought out help, uh, help whether they were you know, Muslim or, or any other background. So it's not that um, our community is worse, but it's just that there's a there's an overall reluctance or inability. Some, I mean, we've actually also asked questions about why aren't you seeking out help, and some of the top responses is affordability. So it's not it's not we actually don't hear about stigma anymore. We we hear about other really basic obstacles to seeking help, like affordability, like finding culturally competent help. But um, Muslims are no worse and no better than anyone else, but it's still only a third of people who need support actually go out and get it or are able to find it. All right, great. Thank you so much. So I did have one question as a panelist. So I was actually <laughs> surprised. I, I don't, It wasn't TikTok, but it was a YouTube video. And then I just Googled it, but it's like, that one doctor was saying that they actually feared licensing. Yeah. So there is like, you know, there, there, you know, that that actually creates a burden for them because they can actually request those um, records for them. So how much is that affecting um, Muslim healthcare workers? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Marjorie, because um, that it's a common conversation that we have with callers on the support line, which is it's an anonymous support line. So, of course, there's that kind of sense of safety there again. But it is a common thing where, you know, it's not even with most Muslim healthcare workers, either due to their insurance plans or their own affordability, they are able to afford going to healthcare. But then it becomes about reportability. Like, where is this information going to go? And there is an internal stigma amongst um, physicians, both culturally within um, just what we think of ourselves and that, you know, we um, how, uh, 
have our own expectations of, of being healthy and, and not needing mental health support. But also, and from a licensing issue, there is a very big um, dilemma here, um, which is, is state by state. And each state um, medical licensing um, board has applications where you um, they ask to disclose um, your mental health. And, um, and in that, um, there is, um, you know, of course, there's a violation of the American Disabilities Act, which is something that we're exploring and trying to um, deal with. But there's also the fact that, you know, um, if they do disclose, then will they be um, watched by, you know, um, either the hospitals, uh, you know, HR um, regarding their mental health? And will they be under a microscope? And will every action be kind of, you know, um, observed in that kind of way? Or will they have to report for mandatory kind of, um, you know, um, uh, therapy sessions and et cetera. And so there does, it's a, it's a very big limit. And there's a, only a, a few states that are actually compliant with ADA regarding this. And that's a side project that I've been working on with other physician-led organizations to, to change that um, kind of punitive outcome. But yes, there is, as we know, with anything that has a stigma, there is systemic issues, there are individual issues, and all of these together are creating these barriers that we're seeing in mental health seeking. Thank you. Hmm. Excellent question. Thank you, Marguerite. Um, and I'll, I'll close out um, here just by asking this question one more. Um, well, actually, you know what? We only have three minutes. So I'm, I'm going to um, stop there with the Q&A and at, now ask you questions. Um, your feedback is incredibly important to us. So please take a few minutes to fill out the poll that we just launched. and. As you do that, um, I just want to close out with a few other points. The full report is shared in the chat and will also be emailed in a follow-up email to everyone that registered. And I want you to—I uh, want to also draw your attention to an early release of some data from our American Muslim poll, which is just in on vaccines and vaccine hesitancy among American Muslims. So please check that out. And please continue to be ambassadors for the facts and share our resources and our research with your network. You can do that um, by sending them a link even to this webinar.